folks and welcome to this episode of Michael's Backyard Marina. I'm working in the evening right now because it's finally cooled off enough. I've been avoiding working on this boat all summer just because it's been so stinking hot outside. You can hear the cicadas in the trees right now. It's We're going through a little bit of a drought right now. We haven't had rain for a few days, not any substantial measurable rain. But it's finally cooled off enough this evening that I can get out here and I'm attempting to put this motor back together. We pulled the timing cover off, the harmonic balancer, the alternator, the engine mount, the belt, and that sort of thing. And I have all my parts to put it back together. I have the flamethrower coil. I have the uh, new rotor and cap. Uh, I have a new electronic ignition. And uh, we're gonna put her back together and a new front crankcase shaft steel. We're gonna go ahead and stick that in as long as we got it apart. Let's jump in here and see what I got going on. First thing I'm gonna do is pull that timing cover back off, put the cover back on, and then we'll stick the harmonic balancer back on. New water pump, deadly noise we heard before. Put a new water pump in and then we're off to the races. Let's uh, jump in and get that water pump, or not water pump, that timing uh, cover seal put on and get inside the boat and get some action going. Right now. All right, we got the cover all cleaned up. Got all the rust off of it I could. Sprayed it with some brake clean. And now I just want to give it a coat of protection just a little bit. turned out quite nice looks pretty new all clean and spiffy we're gonna let that dry overnight and then we'll put it back on the boat in the morning we got everything on the boat cleaned up I'll show you what I did there all right it's the next day and we're ready to install this seal now I've put a little sealant around here so that the gasket will have a nice seal inside and out I want to make sure this thing doesn't leak at all now underneath here this is recessed a little bit so I've cut me a piece of wooden block to sit down in here to support that. So when I'm beating on this thing, it doesn't actually bend or deform the housing, the timing housing. Now there, this starts in, it kind of almost acts like it can push in by hand, but it won't. But anyway, I've got to support it. I got me another wooden block on top and we'll give it a few smacks. It's going right in. We've got that down flush all the way around. Nice and straight, looks really, really good. Worked out really well. But take a minute to do something like that because if you bend this housing up, you can't get it back to what it was, no way. Okay, now what I'm about to do is probably gonna make a lot of you cringe because I don't have another piece of this gasket like this. This is what was on the oil pan goes against the oil pan area and I don't have another gasket and this rubber is not in bad shape it's not in great shape but it's also not in bad shape so what Mr. Michael here is going to do is we're going to reuse that gasket but I'm going to give it some help I'm going to give it a lot of help and the reason I'm going to get away with this I feel is because there's a lot of times that Instead of using a gasket at all, a lot of folks will fill this thing with silicone anyway. So I've got some really good gasket maker. As you can see, this gearbox gasket maker is really tacky. It's actually quite thick to use. I'm going to stick a little bolt right in. The, this is the, the bolts that come up through the oil pan. This is gonna help me hold it in place while I'm messing around here. All right, we got that in there pretty good. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cover the coat the outside the same way I did the inside. Now normally I hate to go this excessive, but I'm gonna have I'll be able to give it plenty of cure time, which is gonna be nice. And this stuff really isn't going anywhere 
And that should seal it up really, really well. All right, we'll let that skin for a minute while I go uncover the boat. All right, I'm gonna catch you up to where we're at outside here on the boat. I've got all these gasket surfaces cleaned up all the way around the water pump area, the timing cover area, the oil pan area. And I flushed this whole area clean with brake cleaner. It's dried overnight. I have drained the oil into the oil pan, so everything's flushed out clean and pretty. But now I've restripped all the oils and everything off these gears. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and put some uh, assembly lube on these gears. I would cover them in oil, but I don't wanna risk oil getting all over my gasketed surfaces right now. And I'm gonna be rolling this motor over to find top dead center in a little bit here. Whoops. And uh, that'll help smear some of this around so I don't end up with a, a dry start on my gears. And this assembly lube won't hurt anything in my oil that I'm gonna add in once I top the oil back off. All right, I think that'll be enough of that. Now I have my oil pan or my timing cover prepared now with gasket sealant on the, on the original gasket here, both front and back. So when this goes in, I'll be able to set it in, put the bolts in the bottom and put the bolts through the cover here and tighten it down. But before I do that, I need to put the gasket on this right here. As you can see, the gasket sits something like that. So I'm gonna go ahead and put gasket sealer, tacky, this uh, Permatex, or it's from uh, Permatex, aviation former gasket sealant liquid. I've used this in the past, it works really well. Like you guys know, I'm not a big proponent of this type of sealant stuff around gasketed surfaces, but when you don't want things, you want to make sure this gasket absolutely works and fills up any voids that may be there. I don't have a problem using this type of thing. I'm also going to put a little extra sealant right here in this corner. Because ultimately our goal is this thing doesn't leak any oil, right? You don't want oil leaks on your boat. That would be a bad thing. Now the worst part is handling this and not getting it all over yourself. So make sure you have plenty of rags around. And as you can see here, I have these two bolts in the bottom holding this one gasket kind of in place for me so it doesn't move around. We'll pull those out. Now I want to see if I can carefully set this back in place. Good luck without screwing it up. I'll go ahead and start a couple of bolts in here to get things lined up. All right, we got the timing cover put back on nice and secure, completely sealed. I'm really confident that's going to hold really, really well. Now we're going to go ahead and put the water pump back on. And here again, I'm going to use some more of this gasket sealant and what I have here is a, re is a really flat surface so I'm really not worried about things leaking but also don't want to, uh, I want to help it have it help me hold the gasket in place which is really nice just like that we're also going to put some sealant on these bolts because some of these bolts go through the block so we want to make sure that they don't leak Alrighty, water pump's installed. So we got the water pump on, the water pump pulley on, the 
I don't know what you want to call it on the front of this motor. It's a pulley holder. It's not a harmonic balancer on this one. It's just a flange. Goes on the shaft, presses on. Got that installed. Got the pulley on. Got the new belt on. And we got, a, got the water pump hose on. I still got to tighten it down. I haven't done that yet. But uh, I'm going to get these torqued properly. And then we'll be ready to set the timing. What I want to do, because of this motor, uh, didn't have enough timing left in the rotation of the distributor. I want to be able to bring this up to top dead center with the little white marking. You probably, probably can't see it there. I'll get you a close-up of it. But there's a mark here. I got painted white on the pulley. That's supposed to be timed out with what you see here on these timing marks. So what I want to do is bring this around so that the number one cylinder is at top dead center and this timing marks at zero basically and see where my distributor rotor cap lands and i'll show you all that detail here in just a second and for some reason somebody's got number one here i've seen this on my other boat and i have no idea why it's that way but this is supposed to be number one so somebody's had this distributor out somebody's rearranged the wires because they couldn't get it right and that's absolutely stupid now somebody, some people have said, well, it doesn't matter. It's in the right firing order as long as you got top dead center where it needs to be. Yeah, folks, that's fine. Rearrange your wires to fix your screw up. Don't do it right. Do it the way you want. But I'm here to tell you, I've got to have number one where number one's at, and the rest will follow. I have no idea why people do that. Because it probably takes them another two minutes to do it right, and they can just do it half-assed otherwise. I'm going to show you how to do it the right way. I'm going to go ahead and get that distributor clear over here. We're going to pull that spark plug wire out of the way. Our distributor cap. Things are a little burnt. Not bad. I'm glad it ran. I just dropped my stuff. Doggone it. Okay, now I'm going to roll the motor up to top. Is my goal. And we'll see what we end up with here. Okay, right now I know that this is top dead center. This is number one cylinder was firing. That's the number one cylinder up front here, right? And they had the number one coil or the wire here, which is not in the right spot. Not even a little bit. It's supposed to be right here at about two o'clock. Okay, now what I noticed is that I couldn't advance this any further. I couldn't retard the timing any further than right here. I was out of adjustment completely. Not to mention, typically this wire is kind of pointing this direction, I do believe. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and pull the distributor all the way out. And to do that, you got to take the retaining bolt and clip out. And this is all it is. Pull that all the way out, set it aside. We should be able to pick the distributor up out of there like this. There's not much to it here. You've got your little screwdriver looking piece on the end here that drives your oil pump this is your timing gear that runs on your camshaft which drives this thing so now in order to get this where i want it because i want to be able to have maximum adjustment look at this i got all kinds of adjustment here now what i want to be able to do is bring this up just out of that slot enough and out of that gear enough that i can rotate it around and get it sort of drop in About that two o'clock position which would be somewhere about right there yeah somebody had this way jacked up because they had this clear around over here man opk i tell you what other people's kids when they do stuff as you can see right here right there the points are just starting to open right there there's your two o'clock position there's your cam load just starting to open that's where it would be firing so that's in the right spot, but it's not all the way down yet. And that's because the slot that drives the pump isn't quite there yet. Now, what you can do, people have, you know, told me, just roll the motor over and it'll drop in. That's true, it will. But me personally, when I know this has to be in a certain position, I can look at it, hold this thing in the right position, see where that screwdriver slot's at, and just slide it up. And it will fall in then. There we go. Now it's sitting all the way down. I've got plenty of rotation here without something getting in the way to get the timing adjusted. 
This is pointing toward the number one cylinder, which is what you want. Now, the other issue I've got is this particular one has a gasket down here. A lot of these distributor shafts, uh, some of them have an O-ring that goes around the shaft and actually seals around the shaft with an O-ring. This one does not. This one's got just a gasket. So I gotta go make me a gasket. So we're gonna pull this back out. Now that I've got it set where I want, I should be able to pull it back out. And you'll see this thing rotate back around this way as it comes out. So I just gotta have it pointed at three o'clock when I put it back in. And we're gonna set this distributor over here and I'm gonna scrape this gasket off and go make me another gasket. All right, we have this, uh, I have the new gasket made, put underneath here. I've got the distributor back so that the, when this is in the right spot, as you can see here, this is basically one, two, three, and four, right? And I've got this pointing right at that uh, number one spark plug on this distributor cap. So now I've got everything lined up where I want, top dead center over here on the other side. All right, I've got this on zero here. You can see my mark on my pulley, the black line inside the white. That's my top dead center there is on zero. And I've got my distributor pointing at the number one spark plug as planned. And I have the rotor pointing to the number one spark plug on the distributor cap. Now everything's lined up and dialed in. Now this has no advance or no retarded timing at this point. Everything's just dead on top dead center. Typically here is where your points would open, but we're not gonna worry about that because we got the distributor pointed where I needed it to point. Now we're gonna go ahead and disassemble the rest of this because we won't need any of this stuff. We'll take the rotor off. I'm gonna go ahead and remove this plate. Now under here, underneath here you have advance weights. These advance weights need to move freely. which these do, but they do look a little rusty. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and pull this plate out and we're gonna clean it up and then put it back in. There is a lot of grease inside this rotor cap too from probably it could be the seal on, your si on the underside here leaking a little bit or somebody just over greased it from up top it looked like to me. You can see here, there's a whole bunch of grease right here. Somebody got crazy. But if you undo these two little screws right here, go ahead and unhook the springs. Now that lifts right off. We'll clean that up. These fly weights or these weights will lift right off. Okay, well now we have our advance weights in here. We've got things lubed up in there. Everything moves really freely. It's rust free now. It's just the way it should be. Now we're ready to start to install our electronic ignition components. First thing we have is our little plate here. Alrighty, once you got the plate on, you can go ahead and put your little magnetic piece on here. That presses down over the lobes. It's gonna fit pretty snug. You should be able to reinstall your cap at that moment in time in this proper position. But we won't do that just yet, because the next thing we wanna do is install our pickup, which I've got mine going in right here, and I'm gonna have it go around just like this and duck out this side. And then these wires will be able to go right on up to our ignition or to our coil plate. Actually, I'll use a nine millimeter socket to Now there's a notch on your cap right here. You're gonna have to file a groove in that cap right here to allow this grommet here to pass through. If you don't, it's gonna crush these wires and it's gonna create a problem it's going to short things out on you and we don't want that to happen. We're going to go ahead and unhook our coil here. And remember which side's positive and negative here. I'll take the, I think it's a 916 socket. Yeah. 
We'll take the 916 socket and take this bracket loose that's holding the coil in place. Now in this case here, positive is on the left, negative is on the right. We'll loosen that Phillips screw right there and we'll put our new coil in this bracket and bolt it back in place. Now that we got the coil back in place, I hook my wires back up positive, positive, negative, negative, and I put the red wire coming off your pickup from your distributor to the positive and the black to the negative. Now what I did here is I ground my cap and put a little groove in it right here all the way through so when it goes down on top of this area here, it won't actually destroy my wires. Before we put the cap on, Let's go ahead and stick our rotor in place. Alrighty, we got all the plug wires back on. One. The cylinders are one, two, three, four, but the firing order is one, three, four. I'm sorry, one, three, two, four. One, three, two, four. So you got one. Firing cylinder number three. Firing cylinder number two. Firing cylinder number four. So that's the firing order. We got the flamethrower coil hooked up. We got the distributor cap on. We haven't tightened it down yet as far as the clamp because I'm planning on making some adjustments. I've currently got it so I can just rotate it by hand with some resistance. That way I'll be able to make my adjustments, get the timing set perfect, and it'll be running like a top. All righty, we got the Napa oil filter here, number 1086. Ready to go back on. Now we got my Napa straight 30 weight oil. We're gonna dump in here. That way I don't forget it and end up smoking my motor. That wouldn't be good at all. Now what I pulled out of here was Autolite 403s. We're putting Autolite 403s back in. Alrighty, we got our spark plug wires on and ignore this right here for now. That's my timing light, but we got our, you know, number one cylinder here, number three, number four, number two. You with me? So your firing orders one, three, four, two. So I had to use one of the old spark plug wires because the kit I bought, the spark plug wires, the, it, it should have came with two longer wires two shorts and two longs and it came with three shorts or medium length it wasn't quite long enough to get to the number three cylinder but that's okay I put one of the old plug wires back on just to see if this thing will run and we've got the timing set now I'm gonna fire it up here and let you hear it run kicks right off and runs beautiful it ran a little started a little hard the first time i started it and i thought i had the video recording and i apologize for missing out on that but i've got the timing set right here i don't know if this is going to be timing lady will show up on the camera but i've got it set at eight degrees eight degrees is where it's supposed to be for this particular motor at idle so that's where we're at and if you've never adjusted your timing before, you basically gotta have your distributor loose. Like you saw me in the earlier the video, how I pulled the distributor out. Well, that clamp nut that's there, you gotta keep that snug just so you can rotate the distributor. You know, you rotate the distributor clockwise or counterclockwise, and you'll see your timing mark move forward or back. And that's how you bring it into your eight degrees. Now the eight degrees is according to the book I've got for 120 horse. So now that I've got it running and it's been operating at temperature for a minute, and she's fully warmed up now, I'm going to check the voltage to see what kind of voltage we got. Coming off the alternator, let's see if it's putting out what it needs to be putting out. And we're looking for about 14 volts or so. I 
get that in the picture. So we're gonna put the positive on that terminal on the back of the alternator. And we'll ground the ground. Twelve point four six at an idle. We're gonna rev it up a little bit and see what we get with a little bit higher idle. That's about eighteen hundred RPM there. There we go, 14.5. This thing's still putting out some good juice. That's good news. So obviously the fuel pump's working, the alternator's working, all the cooling's working. The uh, RPM gauge up here on the dash is working. We're gonna kick it over one more time, start it right for you here again while it's warm. Just bump it and she's running. You really can't beat that. Nineteen sixty-eight. Still purrs like a kitten. climb back inside look at that thing just sit there and purr no more weird bearing noises everything's smooth and running like a champ oh mercy now the one thing left to do here One thing left to do here is with the flamethrower coil, it's a three ohm, ohm coil, it's internally resisted. So you gotta remove the externally resisted wire from this setup. And on my other boat, it shows the purple and white wire in the book. In my other boat, it happened to be the lightest tan. There's two tan wires here. It's the lightest color of the two that I cut right here. And then I ran from another 12 uh, volt source, ignition controlled 12 volt, volt source. So when you turn the ignition off, you eliminate the juice going to this. Run that to this positive and you'll have 12 volts here. I bet if I check it now, we'll look at it real quick. Because if I check it right now, it's probably only got about nine volts right here. I don't know if I'll be able to get the meter in the shop for you without getting my wires tangled up in the running components here. So we're just gonna go ahead and, yeah, 9.9 .9 volts is all I got right there. And, and it still runs. It's just not being as, as optimal as it can be. Now I'll tell you something I did. I'm gonna tell on myself. On my other StarCraft, the 1976 I got, I ran it in this same condition right here for two years. I took it out in the water 80, no less than 87 times over the course of two years. With it not having that 12 volt wire going to the positive side of your coil. And it ran fine. And the funny thing is, before I started making these last two Mississippi trips on my other boat, is I fixed that, got 12 volts going to the coil. Guess what? runs exactly the same no performance difference whatsoever so that's why i wasn't afraid to start this one up without removing that resistance wire from the coil uh works just fine so uh you guys could take that with a grain of salt do with with, with that information what you will uh, but i will put a 12 volt to this thing because like i said it's supposed to have 12 volts going to the coil. You're probably not getting as much spark to the spark plugs as you'd like. These spark plugs are not gapped any wider than factory. Just because you have a hotter ignition, 
you do not open up the gap. That's a myth. Uh, for this particular type of setup, that's a myth. You don't open it and create a bigger gap because you got a hotter spark. Point blank is you just have a hotter spark, okay? And uh, it's gonna ignite the fire a little bit better inside your cylinders. But anyway, she's running great. Uh, I've got some more buttoning up to do in here. Obviously, I gotta put the motor mount back up front. As you can see here, the motor mount's leaning up, <laughs> leaning up against the wall there with the bolts. So uh, the one thing I'm gonna do before I reinstall the motor mount, one person had a great suggestion to put another belt on there. So if you're going on trips and stuff like that with your boat, uh, you gotta remove the motor mount completely to get you another belt put on just by this, the, the, this particular design. So it's nice to go ahead and put another uh, alternator belt on there, water pump alternator belt, and zip tie it off to the side so it doesn't get tangled up in anything, obviously. And then when you do blow a belt, you, know, you obviously, if you're driving an older boat, you better take you some tools with you. You know, I've got me a little tool assortment here that'll be living on the boat, because everything I'm doing on this boat, I'm using these tools to do it with, so I know I have all the tools at hand if I'm out in the water and have to do any repairs. And if you're gonna own an older boat, older boat you're gonna have to be your own mechanic. There's no way you can afford, well, maybe you can if you're richer than I am, uh, you can afford to sit there and take your boat to the marina every time something's leaking or something's making a funny noise. You better become your own mechanic. Otherwise, get a brand new boat with a warranty and don't mess with these old boats. Now, by learning what to do with these old boats like I have, you're gonna save yourself a ton of money and guess what? You're gonna have some expensive fun for cheap. That's what I can tell you for sure. And when I say on the cheap, it's a relative term, right? This boat, for instance, I picked up for 500 bucks. Um, for about, oh, I have to give you a good guess, for about 200 bucks right now, I've got the engine in the condition I want it in. Oil change, water pump, alternator's doing what it needs to do, new rotor, electronic ignition, new plug, plug wires, except for one. I'm gonna get that rectified. Uh, now all I gotta do inside the boat in the engine compartment is I wanna take all the terminals on every connection. What I did on my other boat, it, it gave me, it's given me so many worry-free miles, is I took a little wire wheel with a Dremel and I took all those little connections, took them loose and wire wheeled them, cleaned them up, put them back on to ensure maximum connection and get rid of any corrosion or failure to corrosion because usually you're one startup away from an engine not starting or something not functioning due to a connection, especially on a boat. They run in moist environments. It's, you know, gonna be dewy in the morning, especially if you're out fishing overnight, everything's gonna be covered in dew. You have gotta keep things clean and corrosion free if you want things to work out like you want them to, which is cool, right? Now, the other expensive part of this that you guys might know about is sitting right here, the outdrive. The outdrives are not cheap, but in this case, this one needs a, a gimbal boot replace, which I bought. I have that already purchased. And it's gonna need some new hydraulic hoses. These are cracked and checked, and I would not go out in a lake with these because they're like one trim up or down away from failing you, right? So we're gonna do a little work there. Now these outdrives are not cheap. Uh, the one that was on here, the guy said, oh, we pulled it off because the gimbal boot was leaking. That was probably a truth, maybe. But also the outdrive was locked up and the cap that sits right here was, was loose and it had rust down in there. So yeah, the gimbal boot might've been a problem, but it locking up at speed was probably a second problem. I'm guessing this last time he had this boat out, he got towed in. Now me, I wouldn't have to get towed in because what I'm gonna have right over here is a kicker motor. And I'll be putting a little 9.9 .9 or 15 horse kicker on here that way when this thing, if something happens to the main drive, I'm firing this bad boy up and I'm pushing myself to wherever I need to go. My goal in life is to never be towed in my boat unless I'm being towed by my own boat <laughs> like I did when I ran out of fuel uh, in the old Sea Nymph, but I had my son out there in the banana. I knew I didn't have quite enough gas. I was pushing my limits, but I also towed myself in. So there again, I made my own provisions. I had not a kicker motor, but I did have a trolling motor I could have thrown on there and trolled motor myself back to the dock.
Now I won't bore you putting the motor mount back in because that's just setting that back in there, putting uh, six bolts back in place and the motor mounts back in there. So I won't bore you with that information. Uh, but uh, now we're gonna do it. I'll take you along on the rest of the journey as I'm getting here and start cleaning up some wires as I'll do this out drive. Now the cool thing, I'm gonna give you a little clue about these out drives. You can buy an entire boat, especially from the 19, late 60s to all the way through the 70s. You can buy, a lot of times, an entire boat that's not running. And I've done it multiple times, probably at least 10. For less than 500 bucks, you can buy a boat that's not running. And you don't care if it has a title or registration because guess what? If you buy the right boat, it's got the right outdrive on it. You just bought an outdrive for 500 bucks. Plus, if the engine's actually good, you got a spare motor. And a lot of times you can sell these motors or sell pieces and get all your money back if you're, if you're so inclined to do so. But there again, if you're not a mechanic or a mechanically inclined and able to watch videos and learn from others and do things yourself and get yourself in the water, go out and buy a new boat. Don't waste your time because you're gonna your boating will be frustrating and you will not enjoy it. Uh, because as soon as you break down in the water and you haven't done everything you need to do and you don't know how to fix it, your, your boating will end in frustration. So me and myself and some people I know know how to work on their stuff. That's why you see me buying anything from 1964 to I think my newest boat's a 1981. Uh, because a new fishing boat's going to cost you with fish finder and a nice four stroke outboard and all that fun stuff, it's going to cost you about 25 grand. Now, in my boat, my other StarCraft, I have about 10,000 wrapped up in that boat. I paid 650 for the boat, but I put a lot of electronics on it. I put the top of the line fish finder, or not fish finder, top of the line trolling motor on it. I did all that kind of stuff because that's where I wanted the value. Guess what? This here just keeps you from getting wet. It's everything you bolt to a hull that makes your fishing experience altogether different, right? You gotta have a good reliable motor. If you want a fish finder, get your fish finder. You definitely wanna have a depth finder at all times. Never go out in the water without a depth finder, especially in waters you're not familiar with, cause you will destroy stuff. I even put, uh, I even put a couple of dents, dings in my stainless prop on my boat this past weekend, uh, because I actually had a fish finder that, sh or that showed me the map, showed me the wing dams, yet I got myself a little bit crossed up and I actually kissed a couple of rocks. Didn't do any damage. I was only at an idle when it happened. So it's a couple little dents that I can just file right off and make the prop just smooth and slick as it ever was. Didn't pick up any vibration, didn't bend or break anything, but you gotta be careful. Now, you guys know me well enough. I could go on and go on and go on forever, but you know, I just feel it's important that I share as much knowledge with you as I can so that you guys might be so inclined to go out there and resurrect one of these old boats. Now this is a, there again, 1968 Starcraft Islander. It's got the 120 horse uh, Mer Cruiser inboard, four cylinder, right? Uh, it's got a caddy, it's got a cuddy cabin up front. In a few years or sooner, I'm gonna have some fun with this boat. I'm gonna do some overnights. Uh, I might do a, a couple of test runs where I actually travel the east coast of Iowa from the tip to tip of the east coast of Iowa. Uh, probably gonna take me four days. Four days, maybe five days to do that and fish and cruise and visit some uh, uh, touristy spots, take you guys along with me, but that's coming in a year or two. Maybe sooner, depends on how things go with this. Anyway, I gotta get busy for looking for some outdrives for this thing. I actually scrapped out two boats that had two outdrives on it. Not sure if it's this particular one. I found a, a, a document that I'll share with you in another video that shows all the different years of Mer Cruisers and what outdrives came with them, and it shows the gear ratios which is really slick. So I'm gonna let you guys go now. Maybe you've already clicked off, but don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to hit that thumbs up. That helps the algorithms for me, for YouTube to get more views, get more subscribers, so I can get a little more income from YouTube, so I can keep doing this stuff for you guys, for myself as well. I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna lie to you. This is fun for me too, but I wanna share the knowledge with you guys, keep you guys entertained with stuff and uh, keep moving forward. So you guys get out there and have some fun. If it ain't broke, fix it till it is. Because when you do, you're going to have a lot more fun with it. This is Michael, and I'm out. Because he's got that boom, boom, boom. Awesome, awesome, awesome.